we're all familiar with conservation theorems in classical mechanics. And the conservation of energy, momentum, and angular momentum seem fundamental in the true sense of the word. But that's not really the case. The conservation theorems we know are mere consequences of things much more fundamental. So fundamental that they trace back to the realities regarding space and time. Specifically, what I'm talking about is symmetry. And it's symmetries in space that give rise to the conservation theorems regarding momentum and angular momentum. And it's a symmetry in time that gives rise to the conservation of energy. To understand how these symmetries give rise to these conservation theorems, we need Hamilton's principle and the Lagrangian formalism we covered in the last video. For a system with n degrees of freedom, we defined a system of generalized coordinates q sub i of t, where i varies from 1 to n, and a corresponding set of generalized velocities q dot i of t. We also proved that the path q i of t followed by a system when it changes from one mechanical state to another satisfies this system of differential equations, where the function L is the Lagrangian of the system, defined as a function of the generalized coordinates, the generalized velocities, and time as the difference between the system's total kinetic energy and its total potential energy. In this video, we're going to be covering asymmetry in time. And that symmetry is that the laws of physics are time invariant. They don't change from time to time. The fancy way to say this is time is homogeneous, as in different instants of time are equivalent in the laws of physics, in the eyes of the laws of physics, that is. This may seem like something very trivial, but it has far-reaching implications. The most important of which is that given some system's initial state at a time t sub 1, we can figure out its final state at a later time t sub 2. And it works both ways. To achieve a required final state, we can figure out the sort of configuration, you could say, of the initial state required at the earlier time t1, as in the laws of physics apply the same way no matter what direction of time you invoke. Okay, all of that sounded extremely cool in those fancy terms, but how does any of that lead to the conservation of energy? Well, to understand that, I'm going to have to throw at you another fancy term. And that fancy term is the concept of a closed system. By a closed system, I mean a system free from external forces. I don't want any external forces because I don't want to disturb the quantities I'm studying. And I know what you're thinking, that is a very, very restrictive case and doesn't seem all that useful at all. And yes, I agree with you completely. But mathematics comes to our rescue here, because the mathematics we're going to apply with the Lagrangian formalism and all that applies perfectly well when deriving the conservation of energy for a system where the or a system in a force field that's time independent, as in the potential energy of the particles of that system is a function of the generalized coordinates only. So the analysis we're going to perform holds good for closed systems as well as systems in time independent force fields, but what about two systems interacting with each other? Well, say you have two systems A and B interacting with each other, then this case of two interacting systems can always be enclosed into a bigger system C that can be treated as a closed system. So yeah, we're pretty much good to go, and now for the math. The analysis starts off simply by writing out the Lagrangian as a function of the generalized coordinates, the generalized velocities, and time. And noting that the dependence on time is solely due to the dependence of the generalized coordinates and the generalized velocities on time. In other words, the dependence on time of the Lagrangian is not explicit. If it were explicit, then the laws of mechanics governing the motion of a system would change in form with time. That may seem like pretty far-fetched, but it makes perfect sense considering the scenarios we've outlined so far, so it follows logically that the Lagrangian should not contain time explicitly. This means that the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to time is always going to be zero. This seemingly harmless equation has some drastic consequences for our analysis, because now we want to look at the total time derivative of the Lagrangian, 
Now, the Lagrangian is a function of all the generalized coordinates, all the generalized velocities, and of time implicitly. So, applying the chain rule, we get the sum from i equals 1 to n of partial L by partial qi times dqi by dt plus partial L by partial q dot i times dq dot i by dt plus this term over here, which we know is zero. Okay, now this thing here is just the generalized velocity, and this thing here would be a generalized acceleration. So I'm writing this as the sum from i equals one to n of partial L by partial qi times q dot i plus q dot dot i times partial L by partial q dot i. Okay, so I have the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the generalized coordinates and the generalized velocities. And we know exactly how these two are related from the equations of motion. This thing here equals the time derivative of partial L by partial Q dot I, correct? So that means we can write this as the sum from I equals one to N of Q dot I times D by DT partial L by partial Q dot I plus Q dot dot I times partial L by partial Q dot I. And if you look closely, isn't this just the product rule being applied for the total time derivative of Q dot I times partial L, oh, terribly, sorry about that, partial L by partial Q dot I. Okay, cool. So on the left-hand side, you have the total time derivative of the Lagrangian, and on the right-hand side, you have the derivative with respect to time of the sum from i equals one to n of q dot partial L by partial q dot i. Okay, cool. So what I'm gonna do next is transfer this thing to the right-hand side of the equation and that'll give me the total time derivative of the sum from i equals one to n of q dot i times partial L by partial q dot i minus the Lagrangian equal to zero. Okay, great. So I have this total time derivative being equal to zero. So on integrating with respect to time, we see that this term here that is the sum from i equals one to n of q dot i times partial l by partial q dot i minus l equals some constant that I'm gonna call e. Is this the total energy? We don't know. We just don't know yet. We could do some more math and then prove that this is in fact the total energy. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. But how are we gonna do that? Well, I have this sum to play around with. So let's give that a shot. I know that partial L by partial Q dot I equals partial T minus U by partial Q dot I. And the potential energy is a function of the generalized coordinates only in this case. So that means this is equal to partial T by partial Q dot I as in the derivative of the total kinetic energy with respect to a generalized velocity q dot i. Okay, that's cool. Now what does the most general form for the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy of a system look like that could be expressed as a sum of functions a sub j k and the kinetic energy is supposed to be quadratic in the velocities, right? So that means you should have q dot j times q dot k. And this would be a double sum over j and k from 1 to n. Okay, wait. What is this thing? What is this coefficient? Well, these coefficients a sub j k are actually functions of the generalized coordinates and how exactly do we picture something like this? Well, think of a mass distribution with a variable density. 
So the density would be a function of the location of the various infinitesimal volumes we've cut up the mass into. So for a variable density function, yeah, you would have mass as a function of the locations or the coordinates of those infinitesimal volumes we're talking about. So yeah, that's a good enough example for now. So this is the most general structure for the total kinetic energy. It's a quadratic function in velocities expressed as a doubled sum. And I want to differentiate t partially with respect to some generalized velocity q dot i. And we know for sure that the generalized coordinates and hence velocities are independent of each other. So that means partial q dot j by partial q dot i equals direct delta i j, which is 1 if i equals j and 0 if i doesn't equal j. Bear in mind that this is a double sum. So for the sum over k, the surviving term is going to be k equal to i. Correct? So that means we're going to get one sum where the only surviving k term is the k equal to i term. So we still have the sum over j from 1 to n of a sub j i times q dot j times uh, 1. Okay, cool. But the case is symmetric with respect to j and k. So that means you're going to get another sum corresponding to the surviving j term. So that would be a sum over k from 1 to n of a sub... Uh, wait a second, that was... Yes, yes, indeed. So that should be i k times the generalized velocity q dot k. So surviving k term here, surviving j term here. I hope I got the English right while narrating all of this, but I hope you understood the math behind it. The case is symmetric, and we have surviving j and k terms. Great. Now, because j and k are just dummy indices, we could just rename them both to j. Okay, that should work quite nicely. So what do we have here? And obviously a sub j i is going to be the same as a sub i j. Great. So what we have here is partial t by partial q dot i being equal to twice the sum over j from 1 to n of a sub j i times q dot j. And we're not done yet. We needed to multiply this thing by q dot i as well. So we have a q dot i term over here. And we had the sum over i as well. So again, we have this double sum. And isn't the structure exactly the kinetic energy function I wrote out earlier, the total kinetic energy thing? So that means the sum here is just twice the kinetic energy, which is pretty damn cool. Now returning back to that equation, so we just found out that this here is twice the kinetic energy and L here is T minus U. So that means the two negatives give you a positive for U and two T minus T is just one times T. So we have total kinetic energy plus total potential energy being equal to that constant of integration E. And this constant of integration is the total energy of the system. Hence proved the conservation of energy from the symmetry of time. What we just witnessed was beautiful. We started off with something extremely fundamental, the, the homogeneous nature of time. And that led to a conservation theorem in energy, one of the most important tools in physics. And this whole exercise was an example of Noether's theorem, which states that the conservation theorems in physics all arise from symmetries and... In this case, it was a symmetry in time that led to a conservation principle in energy. This was insanely cool. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. We're not just done yet. In the next video, we're going to be talking about spatial symmetries that give rise to conservation theorems in momentum. Thank you. See you next time.